Let's pray as we get started. Father, I just pray you be with us as we get into your word, Lord. This is the service that we've set apart and set aside, uh, Lord, to really minister to serious believers uh, who want to know you more and want to get into the word more and want to have a time that's reflective uh, as we sing uh, songs that reflect on your name as we uh, get into the word and, and study it. Lord, I pray that you would change our hearts and transform us through it, uh, that we might renew our minds and prove that good and perfect and, and uh, excellent will that you have for us and for our lives, Lord, and for your kingdom. All glory to you, Lord, in your name. Amen. I don't have Buff here this morning, so I can plug this thing in and not worry about him. <laughs> Constantly waiting to catch me as I trip over it. That's right. If I trip, just pretend like it's, you know, not a big deal. We're going to go with red today because people couldn't see the yellow and people said they couldn't see the green. So uh, is, that, is that pretty easy to see? All right. Good. Okay. Everyone suffers in this fallen world. You know, sin has brought death. We know that. It's brought suffering. We know that. The more miraculous and eminently gracious reality is that everyone also experiences good. I understand the suffering. I get sin. I understand it intensely within myself as well as within all of you little sinners. Um, I, I know how we all are, right? And so I get that, but, you know, uh, some people talk about the problem of good like, how can we explain why anything good happens to any of us based on the way that human beings have behaved uh, towards a good and holy God? God tells us the wages of sin is death. It's the free gift of God that's eternal life. But even those with sinful hearts and unjust and ugly lives of rebellion, like many of us had, even those people experience happiness and many blessings in the world. This is grace that God gives to everyone. Matthew 5, 43 through 48 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And this is what's interesting. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Everybody gets this level of grace from the Lord, good or evil, and that's a miraculous blessing. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren, your buddies, your friends only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. And so the idea here is, listen, God has all of these people who act as enemies to him, and he still has the sun shine on them, and the rain falls for them, and the crops grow, and they have food, and they have all of these things. If he can do that to those who are evil to him, you also should bless your uh, enemies, love your enemies, and, and live in that way, because that's what it looks like to be perfect like God. Now, James 1, 16 through 17 says this, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Every good gift. So, so I want you to think about this, and, and, and I'm telling you this because I think from an evangelism perspective, this is an important thing for you to understand. That when you're talking to people and you talk about, is there anything good in your life? And they say, yeah, I, you know, I have this good thing or that good thing. I love my kids or I love going on a hike or I love, love whatever. They need to understand that every, every, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father. It comes down, comes down from God. So if there's any good thing happening, anything at all, it is from the Lord. The implication here is that the bad things that happen, they're not from him. They're from our own sin. They're from the brokenness that we've caused in the world. And that's why there is suffering. Suffering is the result of sinfulness, and we all suffer. 
right? Those who have been justified by Jesus Christ and those who reject Christ suffer. In the same way the sun shines on us, suffering falls on us. The difference is one of those things is of God, like every good gift is, and one of those things is because of sin. It's of the devil, if you will. That's why suffering exists. Now, Christians are going to suffer in that way. The same way that everybody suffers. You do not, when you become a Christ follower, get out of suffering. God does not now block all of the suffering from the sinful world from, from getting to you. That happens because the world's fallen. But there's actually another reason for the suffering of Christ followers. And this is an important one. And you need to understand it if you want to be equipped as a Christ follower moving forward now, especially. And that is that Christ followers suffer because of the Lord's words that we just read in Matthew. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. There will be those who hate you, curse you, spitefully use you, and persecute you. That's beyond the regular suffering that we all have. In addition to that, you pick up, as a Christ follower, persecution. The suffering that you will experience from that. It's an additional to the normal suffering of the sinful world. Now, along with that, you also get joy, hope, the peace that surpasses understanding, all those things to deal with both the suffering of the world and the suffering that will come from persecution. But you need to understand that both of those things are part of the life of a Christ follower. It's because you're different and because you're set apart that will bring persecution and suffering in your life. Now, we've been studying 1 Peter, and one of the things the Holy Spirit has inspired Peter to teach us through the scripture is how to think about suffering, right? These churches Peter was writing to, they were the churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. There were plenty of idol-worshiping Gentiles, pagans, who lived according to the world. And the Christians that were in these churches, the Gentile Christians, used to live that way too. And then they stopped living that way when they found Jesus Christ. They went, they lived that way and they went away from living that way. And I don't know how many of you have had this experience in life where you ran with a certain crowd and then you became a Christ follower and you no longer had anything in common with that crowd and you stopped running with that crowd. And when you stopped running from that crowd, they didn't treat you as well. They either felt judged by you or they, or they made fun of you or whatever the case may be. Well, that is the, that's the story of these churches. These were all people living in a time that was vile in terms of morality. And they also were vile in terms of morality. They found Jesus Christ, and they, and they were separate from these folks, and they were experiencing just from that alone persecution from the people that they were around. So in chapter 4, we have Peter showing that Christ's suffering is how we should also handle suffering as his disciples. And so we're going to try to go through all of chapter 4 today, um, which only leaves us one chapter in 1 Peter, and then we get to get to the next uh, thing, keep getting into the Word. Uh, But here we go. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh. So this therefore is referring back to last week, what we, what we read at the end of chapter 3 that Pastor Dave was teaching, talks about the death of Christ and what that brings. So we say, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. It's an interesting way to talk about your mind. Arm yourself. Arm yourself with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So Christ has suffered, and we're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to be disciples of of Jesus Christ. We're Christ's followers. So if he has suffered, I don't know what makes any of us think that we will not also suffer. We will. Right, And so we got to arm ourselves with the same mind, the mind of Christ. You can read about that 1 Corinthians 2 at the end of the chapter there, for we have the mind of Christ. you got to arm yourself with the mind of Christ towards suffering. Towards suffering, okay? Oh, am I, did I skip one? No, nope, that's right. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So there's this point, okay? You, um, this is you. In case you didn't know, it looks just to hear him give some smiley. Okay, that's you, okay? You come to a point in time, okay? We're just going to say, boom, this point happens. And from that point forward, you're being pulled by your future, okay? You're, you are now 
headed to heaven. You are already seated in the heavenly places. You've been justified. You've been sanctified. You've been made Christ. You are a child of God. When that happens, you should no longer live the rest of your time in the flesh. Okay. In the flesh. So obviously, I don't mean you should exit your body, right? That's not, you can't do that. What it means is you should no longer live for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. It refers to the fact that so much of what we're drawn towards in the flesh is just the lusts, right? Whether that's sexuality, whether that's, uh, you know, all the classic stuff, lying, cheating, stealing, trying to get all the guns, girls, and gold, all the stuff that people do. That they walk around and they do in the lust of flesh, you know, alcoholism and drug abuse and all these things where we're, where we're feeding the flesh instead of trying to do the will of God. So Peter's saying, look, once you hit this point right here, after this point, everything going forward is about the will of God. Before that, you lived totally for yourself and for your flesh, but moving forward, you're living for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles. Now, what's he referring to here? Of course, the Gentiles, we've discussed this before, is anyone but the Jews. At this time in history, the only people who were, as a group, living by the Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture at that time, the New Testament was obviously being written as he wrote these words, but the Old Testament Scripture were the Jewish people. Everyone else was living completely according to the world, worshiping idols, you know, crazy sexual immorality, you know, the revelry, you know, just, just debauchery is the word we would use for it, is the way that things were going in these big cities in the Roman world at this time. And he's saying, look, you have spent enough of your past life living this way. And we talk about uh, the time that we will come before the Lord, not for judgment, because we're saved, right, as Christ followers. But rather to, for God to look at us and decide what rewards he has for us. And there will be those things that are, that are straw, wood, stubble, hay, this type of thing. And those things are all flammable. They burn. And then there will be the gold, silver, or the precious stones. Those things are not flammable. They don't burn. All of this time, enough of our past lifetime was spent getting all of that Flammable stuff, right? wood, hay, and stubble. That's what happened. He said, look, you've done enough of that living in the will of the Gentiles. What's the will of the Gentiles? Well, we, we saw it. It's the lusts of men. That's what the will of the Gentiles are. So we spent enough time doing that when we walked in lewdness. Most of us can say, yeah. Lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties. It's an interesting word in the Greek. It's only used in this spot, this Greek word for drinking parties. And uh, I think if you have the old King James Version, it refers to it as banqueting, which most of us would be like, banqueting? Like, you know, so there's like in sports at the end of the year, you have the banquet or whatever. You're like, I'm not supposed to do that anymore? I, how am I supposed to get my most improved trophy? Um, I was the most improved water boy three years straight, just so you know. Um, it's not true. I wasn't very good at it at all. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not banqueting, not the way you'd think of that word. It's drinking parties. And what's funny is a lot of these Greek words, it'll say, you can, we, we find this word used because, of course, they have to understand Koine Greek, which is a language people aren't speaking or using anymore. So they have to go back to the writers, right? All the Greek writers to understand how it's used. This word, the drinking parties word, it lists this whole, like, all of them use this word because it was so common. These kinds of, and, and any of you who have been to a drinking party, you know what it is. It's a party that you go to to get drunk, Right? To basically, you know, live in dissipation with, with friends, okay? This is how we lived, in abominable idolatries. This is, this is the life that they lived. He's describing the will of the Gentiles. It was lewdness, lust. They used to, they used to uh, draw pornography on the walls in these towns. It was, they, were, they were disgusting when it came to sexuality, sort of like us right now, right? Lust, drunkenness, revelries. That, that word probably is referring to uh, the combination of uh, uh, intoxicants and sexual immorality, that type of thing. I'm not going to get too far into that. Dr
Nicene parties and idolatries. They're worshiping idols. They're going to the temples of idols and sleeping with idol prostitutes, both men and women. I mean, it's just, it's a disaster. And this is what they all came out of. And he's saying, look, you spend enough time in that. There's enough shame built up. There's enough wood, hay, and stubble built up. Once you get to that point right here, when you're at this point and you're moving this way, it's time to stop all of that. And, and there's a reason he's going to get into it because he's talking about suffering. And there are two types of suffering that he's talking about. One is the type of suffering you experience because of righteousness. And one is the type of suffering you deserve because of wickedness. And so he's saying he's going to be getting to this point where he says, look, and he's, and he's talked about it earlier too. It's better to suffer for doing right than for doing wrong. It's better to suffer for doing right because what does that produce? Gold, silver, precious stones. When the Lord is, is looking at you and he's giving out rewards, do you not think that there will be rewards when you have suffered faithfully for righteousness? But when you suffer for wickedness, that's what hay and stubble. Yeah, I can't believe you let me suffer. And he's like, you were living in these things. What did you expect to have happen? In regard to these they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Well, this is what I was just talking about. They lived this life. They lived all this time in the world of the Gentiles and the culture of the Gentiles, which was dissipation, right? This was a flood of dissipation, all these things that I just mentioned. And this is what these people were doing. They get saved. They, they, they have these churches, and they start living right. I don't think that they were being harsh or mean or judgmental to the rest of the people. They were probably preaching Jesus, but I don't think they were being judgmental. It didn't matter. These people started speaking evil of them because they no longer did the things that they did. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. When you are part of a group that does things that are evil and does things that are wrong, and you step out of that and go, I follow Jesus now, and that can't be a part of it. What it does is it brings judgment in their own life. Even though you're not judging them, you're not the one bringing the judgment to them, you're simply making a judgment about what's right and wrong because you're looking at the scripture and they feel the pressure of that. That's why Jesus brings a sword, right? It cuts the heart. The word of God cuts to the heart, right? You're the aroma of life to some and the aroma of death leading to death to others because when you say, no, I walk with Jesus now, not because I'm perfect, but because he is. I have his grace, and now I'm going to walk in this direction. And, and what you're doing is saying, clearly the things and the way that you're living are wrong and inconsistent with somebody who loves God, inconsistent with somebody who wants to live according to his ways. And so they feel that judgment. So what they do is they got to, they got to get you back in. And the classic way to do that starts in elementary school when you say things like, you know, philosophical statements. Neener, 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 um, right? This kind of thing. Um, that's, that's what you do. They speak evil of you. They make fun of you. Oh, you're too good for us now. Oh, you're, you know, you're too weak to do this, to do the thing. You, you don't want to hang out with the guys. You don't want to hang out with the girls. Oh, you're not going to come to this party now. Oh, you're judging us. Oh, you're better than us. All this. All this is part of what's it, what's it trying to do. It's trying to break you down. Because Satan will do anything he can to pull you from being faithful, moving in that correct direction to walking over here or walking over there or being distracted over here or feeling bad over there. The persecution has a purpose. That purpose is to make you unfruitful. If you're saved, Satan can't get you out of the hands of Christ, but he can attack you to try to make you unfruitful. He can get you focused on a million things. I mean, how often do I have to ask myself when I'm Looking at this, like, do I need, I need to put this down, right? How distracting are these things? It's distracting. What do we need to be doing? What does our life need to look like? Well, Satan wants to distract. And one of the ways that this happens is the persecution that comes from the group that you used to run with. I like the fact that they use this term. You don't run with them anymore. I don't run with those boys no more. They don't like it. How many people have come to the Lord, been gloriously saved, baptized, started their walk, and end up back with the group that they used to hang out with. A lot. And what happens? They just become unfruitful. It's not, if they, if they were legitimately saved, it's not that they're not saved. It's just that there's no rewards in that life. You end up saved as through fire, 
No rewards to show. Not even a nose ring. Right? You got nothing. Because when it came down to it, you let them speaking evil of you, and you let them thinking it's strange that you don't run with them anymore, bring you back in. I, as an attorney, I used to do some uh, criminal law stuff. And while my clients never went to jail, because, you know, no, they did sometimes. They pled guilty. They were guilty, okay? They pled guilty. Um, but people would go to jail sometimes, and sometimes um, there would be, I, I tried to draw people and evangelize the people who were my clients. And um, sometimes you would see people who would have a change, or when they're in prison. You know, it's kind of classic that in prison people will sometimes find the Lord. And I think legitimately so. Then what happens is they get out, and the only group they know to go to, and maybe their own families in some cases, are living like this, right? This is what they're living like. And the person goes back and they quickly get caught back up and then all that they had going in their walk with the Lord, all, all, the, all the, uh, the fruitfulness that was there, it all dries up into nothing. Little persecution and they fall apart. It says, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Who is he talking about? Who's they? The people who are persecuting you, the people who are speaking evil of you, they also will give an account before the Lord. So as they speak evil of you, and as you deal with the persecution of people who don't like the way that you live, recognize that they will give an account to Jesus Christ, the righteous judge. As you think about that, we also have to remember that we also must give an account. So if we get moved by that, if we're not on the rock and we get moved because somebody said things that made us feel bad. And here we go back into revelries and drinking parties and, and all the rest of this. We also will answer before the righteous judge for that. For this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Who, who, who is this? Who's living according to God in the spirit? Well, there are people who are already dead. We have this uh, 1 Thessalonians. Actually, this is some of where we get the information that the Bible gives us about the rapture. Is there are people who thought, hey, there are people who have died before Jesus came back. What's happening to them? Right? And Paul's like, chill out. Right? The dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are, who are still here will be caught up in the air together with them. And here, Peter's saying, hey, look, there are believers who are dead, who had the gospel preached, and even though they died according to the flesh because your bodies, unless the Lord comes back, they're going to die. But they're alive. They live according to God and the Spirit. The gospel was preached. They believed. They passed away. And now they're still alive. In other words, you have more than just this world to answer for. If you decide that people who are persecuting you and so on are going to win, you have an eternity that that's going to have an effect on. And the rewards that you will receive, right? And your faithfulness to Christ. And then he says this, and he was right then, and he's certainly right now, but the end of all things is at hand. Sounds like something they'd say in Lord of the Rings. Frodo, the end of all things is at hand. Sounds good. I like that. He's right. Now, in, in, in Peter's mind, just like in yours, we always are ready for the return of Christ. But he, of course, is referring to this. When Christ came, died, and rose again, we began a period of time. Paul calls it the time of the Gentiles. He talks about when the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, that's when we get into the tribulation, right? So there's this kind of, some people call it the church age, right? Pentecost happens, the church age begins. Now, the church age is the end, okay? How long it lasts is up to the Lord. How long he has that last? Of course, to him, a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. It's been about 2,000 years of the church age. I don't think Peter thought it was going to be another 2,000 years. I think he was really hoping it was going to be over soon, although he did know because God... Jesus told him at the end of the book of John, you can read about this, that he was going to die and how he was going to die. But he, of course, wanted the return of Christ. All Christians at all times have always wanted the return of Christ. We, we want it desperately, right? But the Lord is gracious and patient and wants as many as possible to come to him. He's drawing men and women and children to himself, and he wants to see that happen. But the end of all things is at hand. And of course, Peter could say that knowing he was in the age, because the last week of Daniel, right? There's, there's the 49 weeks. Uh, the last week of Daniel is the tribulation. We're actually, Jesus was the week before that. Then there's the church age. Then there's the last week. 
Here we sit in the end of all things. And now, here's the deal. It's unquestionable. Peter couldn't have seen the things that we've seen. As he's, as he's writing, as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write, he couldn't have seen or understood the things that, that we understood. Certainly, he would have written this before the book of Revelation was even written. So he didn't even have the revelation that John had. He just knew Jesus was coming back. Why? Because he told him. Jesus told him he was coming back. So he knew he was coming back. What we now know is that we are absolutely unequivocally at the end of all things. Now, I don't give dates, okay? Probably next Thursday. No, I'm just kidding. It's not, I, don't, I don't give dates. When I was having John type the thing about Christ's return, he says, Thank the God, praise God that Christ will return on Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. No, no, we don't know that, okay? We don't know that. What we know, what we know is the season that we're in. The scripture talks about, Jesus talks about when the fig leaf blossoms, right? We know, we, we have an idea of when that was. We have an idea that this is the last generation. That generation is the last generation that will come before the end of all these things. Now, could we be wrong? Maybe. But the evidence now is much more than the evidence has ever been. People will say, oh my goodness, people have always said this, and they're all, they always predict, and they always say, that's fine, and that's true. People have been saying for a long time that the Lord was coming back. People thought it was going to happen in the 70s. People thought Hitler was the Antichrist. People thought all kinds of things. But the fact that people thought something and were wrong doesn't mean that what people realize now means that they're wrong also. That would be a logical fallacy to believe that. So what I would say to you as your pastor is forget almost anything else other than can't you just feel it? Can't you just feel it? We're close. We're close. And so it says this. The end of all things is at hand, and then there's a therefore. Therefore means this. Because of this, because the end of all things is at hand, be serious and watchful in your prayers. What does that mean? Well, it's kind of like what we did today. Praying for the anti-Semitism that's going on right now. You have college campuses across the United States of America full of these people who are chanting for the destruction of the state of Israel, who are supporting Hamas. I mean, I, it's, I don't even understand it. You have people, like, they're waving a rainbow flag and saying Hamas, and I'm like, they'll throw you off a building if you go there with that flag and you're supporting them. It just shows the deception of Satan in the world and in many ways. Part of what we're going to be dealing with in the, in the series that we're doing in the second service. Uh, the family service, but the end of things is there. And so what do you pray for? Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ because persecution is going to be on an uptick Uh, all around the world. Pray for God's chosen people, the Jewish people, who will be, who will eventually see him as the Messiah. We pray for them. We pray for their families because they are his people. Paul loved them so much. She thought, "I, I would even, I would go to hell if I could just get them saved, if that were possible, which is not for him to do that he was saved. But he loved them that much. Well, so should we. We should love God's chosen people. That's that Jesus came through the Jewish people. So we should be praying for them. And of course, Peter also was a Jewish man. We should be praying for our own evangelism because we want to see as many people as possible come to the Lord. And here's the thing. You got to be serious now. Back in the day, when I was younger, I, care, I actually cared a lot about evangelism when I was a kid because I grew up in the church and, and didn't want people going to hell. And I still don't want people going to hell. And there was a long period of time there where I just kind of thought about, you know, the things you think about as a young person. I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want to, you know, be a professional football player. That did not work. Um, not even a little bit. Uh, you know, you have, you have your dreams, you have your things you want to do, and you think about those. And what happens is as you do that, sometimes you lose your seriousness. You get distracted from it. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't live your life and love your life. Until the Lord comes back, we continue to do the things we ought to do and, and have joy in it. You know, little Dylan is out there in the, in the uh, lobby with his grandpa, Dave. And I love that little baby. And I enjoy it. I, I, I'm all for it. Have your families. Do what you're called to do. Do the thing and enjoy every bit of it. But meanwhile, also be serious recognizing the hour that we're in. Be serious and be watchful in your prayers. Prepare yourself 
for the persecution and prepare yourself for the spiritual battle that is being waged that is getting very, very intense. Many of you would have stories about the spiritual battles you've been facing and more and more and more as time has gone on. And you see the love of people growing cold. And you see even Christ followers, Christians, kind of go, you know, getting distracted in a million different ways and chasing after teachers who will tell them how great everything's going to be instead of just getting serious and facing the time that we're in. Enjoy everything God's given you. I, I think life is awesome. God made it. I think marriage and kids, if that's what God calls you, awesome. I think singleness, awesome. I think all the things that God has for us in our life, awesome. Whatever he's called you to, he's called you to, and you, so you should live it out fully unto him. But be serious. And above all things, have a fervent love for one another. Hmm. Fervent love. A fervent love for one another. You can't have a fervent love for one another and constantly be annoyed by each other. You can't have a fervent love for one another and talk negatively about one another in private. You can't have a fervent love for one another and not want to be around one another, support one another. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Isn't that the truth? If people didn't love me, I think they would be nothing but annoyed with me. It's people's love for me and my love for them that covers a multitude of sins. The forbearance that we show one another as we will love one another is, is huge. And so we are called to live that way. And this is in the context of, hey, look, it's the end of the age. Our love needs to be more fervent, hotter, more on fire than it's ever been if we're going to support one another in this time that we're in. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Now, there are people who are just grumblers in general. You know, they, it's almost like they were born that way. Like Generation X, like my whole generation, was just considered to be kind of that way. Everything sucks. Everything, you know. Yeah. You know. But eventually, we, you know, got money. You know, got jobs, and then it was like, oh, it's not that bad. But when you're a kid, you know, all the music was like, wah, wah. you know, it was just that was the way it was. So we were kind of a grumbling little generation. But then there are other people who, the older they get, the more grumbly they get. And there are some people who, the older they get, the more willing to be pleased they get. you got to decide which one you're going to be, but the Scripture is very clear about which one. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Make it easier for the people around you. Be hospitable. Hospitality is a huge biblical principle going all the way back. The Jewish people have a very high value on hospitality because that's what God taught them. And so you need to be hospitable. I don't, I'm not saying invite everyone to your home every day. I'm saying be hospitable. Be a person who makes other people feel comfortable. Takes care of them. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. Your gifts aren't about you. It's a good indicator right there. They're about ministering to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So God's given you grace. You have received grace from God. Now, just like your money or just like your time or just like anything else, any gift you have, you should steward well. And the way that we steward this gift of the manifold grace of God is to use our gifts to minister to each other. You got a gift, give it away. Minister to each other. Think about each other. One of the things I have noticed in, this, in these last days is how many people are utterly self-absorbed. They just can't think about other people. Everything is about them. This is just a narcissistic time in our culture. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess. You can see it very prominently on like social media sites. How many pictures of yourself do we need to see? You're great. You're so, you're so, it's great. You look great. Oh, again. Yep. Every, you're great. Just stop. Just stop. And I know it's not all, it's not everybody's doing it because they're bad narcissistic person. It's a lot though. I'll just tell you, like, I don't need to see a picture of you every day. Um, you don't need to put a picture of you every day. Now, maybe, maybe it's okay for some people. I don't think everyone's heart is wrong in this, I will say. 
There are people who take pictures of themselves because they have something to say that's actually valuable. But there's a lot of people, particularly those that are younger, where it's just a, you know. That's, look, is that not what's, what people are doing? They're just completely about themselves. Tell me I look good. You look great. Now knock it off and think about somebody else. We got to start thinking about other people. We got to start thinking about other people. That's how we're stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let them speak as the oracles of God. Let's speak the word of God. Speak the truth of God. If you're going to talk, speak the truth of God. Don't waste your words on nonsense. If anyone ministers, let them do it as with the ability which God supplies. Recognize that when you're ministering, you are doing that with God's ability. The Holy Spirit, I pray for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do any of the ministering that I do. I cannot stand here and do this. I can't do what I'll do in the next service. I can't do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So I do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Where does the glory belong for the things that we accomplish with the gifts that we were given when we steward them? The glory belongs to Jesus Christ. It belongs to God. So if you do anything that's about glorifying yourself, you need to rethink that. Your gifts were not given to you to be used to aggrandize you. Your gifts were given to you to serve other people that God might be glorified through your gifts, the gifts that he's the one who gave you in the first place. That's the way it works. It keeps you humble which I can just tell you, life is a lot easier when you're not constantly worried about what other people think about you. Can I just, can I, let me say this again so that you get it, for those in the back. Life is a lot easier when you are not constantly worried about what other people think about you. Okay? Some people think positive things about me. I don't know why. Others think negative things about me. I'm going to sleep fine tonight either way. Because the only one who I'm concerned about is the Lord. And when I fail him, 1 John 1, 9 comes into play. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. And if I don't fail him, and I know that I'm doing what he's called me to do, I don't care what everybody else thinks about me in terms of the way I feel about myself. I care because, of course, it hurts when somebody says, you know, something negative to you. But I don't care in terms of my own value, and you don't need to either. All the glory goes to him. That way you don't, you don't have to worry about any of it for yourself. And that makes life easier. 950. Uh, yeah, we better stop here. Um, because we're going to get into this fiery trial, which is to try you. And I want to get to that next week. So we're going to do communion now. Um, let's have them grab that. Let me just say this. Because we didn't get all the way through chapter 4. I'm sure you're shocked. But I got through 11 verses. That's pretty good. There's times when I only get through one. But here's the thing, guys. If you are going to walk around and not prepare yourself, you can move this thing while I'm talking if you want, and not prepare yourself for what the Lord has told us you need to be prepared for, the end of the age, the persecution that's coming, Right? The, the life that you're called to live, if you're not going to do those things, you're just simply not going to be ready and equipped to work for the kingdom. And that's your calling. That's your calling. You have a purpose in life. You're not just a meat sack like the quote-unquote scientists would say. The Lord is doing things. He's working. In the Chronicles of Narnia, which I'm wearing... Western Wild Narnia shirt today. <laughs> Say, Aslan is on the move. Christ is on the move. In your life and in the lives of other people who are starting to wake up to the nonsense and the vileness and the craziness of the world and they're starting to look for answers. And when they're looking for those answers, God has put you in their lives as people who can give them those answers because you know them. Because you know Jesus Christ, but you've got to be prepared. You've got to be prepared. And so be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be ready for the things that we know will happen as we walk through the end of the age together.